Hi, welcome to Cafe To Do Nine. Today, we're very happy and honored to have Dr. Myrna Weisman. Dr. Myrna Weisman is the professor of epidemiology from Columbia University. More importantly, she is the co-founder of interpersonal psychotherapy IPT. Hi, Dr. Weisman. Hello. Thank you so much for coming to Cafe Two Two Nine. So, some of our audience may not know what IPT is about and where it comes from. Would you mind to share us a story about how you developed it? Oh, sure. Happy to. IPT is is interpersonal psychotherapy. It was mainly developed for depression, but it's now been modified for other disorders.、Mm-hmm. The basic idea behind IPT is that there are many causes of psychiatric disorders, and certainly biology and genetics play a good role in it.、Uh-huh. But also, life events are very important. And whatever the cause of depression, it happens in an interpersonal context.、Uh-huh. For example, with depression, oftentimes you'll find that there's grief, a bereavement, somebody has died, or disputes. There's disputes with somebody in social life that is very important to the person. Transitions. There are major changes in life which sort of upheave the person, and finally, loneliness. And social isolation.、Uh-huh. So IPT tries to understand the social interpersonal origins of the onset of symptoms, and tackles it by finding out what the symptoms are, when they began, and what was going on in the person's life. And there are different methods that have been developed and are specified for dealing with those four problem areas: grief, disputes. Transitions and loneliness. When IPT was developed, there were no clinical trials showing that IP that psychotherapy worked. In fact, the conventional wisdom was that you couldn't study psychotherapy because every therapist and every patient was different. At that time, Aaron Beck was developing cognitive therapy. He was writing down in a manual the procedures for cognitive therapy. My late husband Jerry Clareman was working on a major clinical trial, looking at the efficacy of medication for the treatment of depression, and he felt that you had to include psychotherapy because most patients were receiving psychotherapy, and you wanted to mimic clinical practice. Now he and Aaron Beck were friends, and he had great respect for Aaron. We called Tim. But he thought that cognitive therapy was not what was usually used, or behavioral therapy was usually used at that time in a medication clinic, and he wanted something that was like supportive psychotherapy. The problem was that there were no manuals for psych- supportive psychotherapy. There were no manuals really for anything, and there were no clinical trials, and there was real question as to whether psychotherapy worked. Although it was a major treatment for depression, it was within that background that Jerry、um, started to write down the procedures for what he thought would be good treatment psychotherapeutically for someone who had a depression, and from that became IPT. And at the same time that CBT was being developed by、um, Aaron Beck. Uh, John Rush, who's now a major psychiatrist, doing clinical trials and other things, he was the junior person helping Dr. Beck, and I was the junior person helping、um, Dr. Clareman, who later became my husband. So the idea was that we would write it down in a manual, and then test it out to see if it worked, and do the first clinical trial testing the efficacy. Of a psychotherapy against different control conditions, and that's how it started. And it wasn't until 1984, when there were two clinical trials showing that IPT worked, and there were also two clinical trials showing that CBT worked. Wow! So around the same time, we, we wrote the manual and published the book.、Um, Jerry was very much a pharmacologist. And he believed in science. We never have seen IPT as a religion or the only treatment there is. It's one of the treatments in the toolbox, 
but we felt it was very important to show that it worked before it was disseminated. The FDA, which improves drugs for treat use for treatments, uh, requires at least two clinical trials showing efficacy. Jerry felt that there should be two clinical trials of IPT before it was put into a manual for dissemination. And that happened, and, and there was a very large study comparing IPT, CBT, and amitriptyline medication. Um, we wrote the manual and the first book uh, called Interpersonal Psychotherapy, published in 1984. So that's the history in a nutshell. The only problem, the, the major problem is that Jerry died very young and it was uh, up to me to carry the legacy and that was difficult. However, um, he did have some students and very recently there's been a flourishing, there's almost 200 clinical trials of IPT it's translated into many, many languages, including recently Swahili. And there's a big international uh, use of IPT in uh, especially low and middle income countries. So I would say that one of the very important thing about IPT is that you are one of the pioneers of uh, developing a clinical intervention that's evidence-based by science. Because I think in the, in, the, in the past, there are not as many evidence-based practice as of now. So IPT is one of the earlier one where others would model after. Well, I like to think that, uh, that we, me, Aaron Beck, John Rush, Jerry Clareman, myself, set the stage for the testing of the efficacy of psychotherapy. And now there are others that uh, have been shown to be quite efficacious, problem solving, mindfulness, um, and there are others. And that has led to psychotherapy being more, I think, reimbursed and more accepted and uh, respectable. Yeah, this is a real a trend move. I mean, you're, you're studying the trend for what's more acceptable, what's more scientific, what's more validated. So it is uh, something that our audience should really know that the importance of IPT is not just an intervention, but an intervention that's evidence-based, that now the new, the new therapies are modeling after. Yes, and that has really helped the field of psychotherapy. You know, people uh, outside of psychiatry or psychology feel comfortable recommending it. There's evidence for it. And I supervise residents in IPT, but I'm very clear this is not a religious cult. Um, some patients we think don't do well on them, or some patients after they've completed a course of IPT, which is a brief treatment, we decide we recommend they go into a different type of treatment. Um, and that's the way it should be. Sure, sure, right. So I think some of our audience may not know, I mean, some of them probably never went through therapy or any, any form of therapy. So let's just bring it back. IPT, we started at, you started out IPT as an intervention for people who are depressed. And based on what you say earlier, one way to help people's depression is by helping them examine their relationship with others, right? And, and it is, so it's important that the, when we learn about our relationship with others or our relational pattern with others better, it can help us to address our mental distress. That's a good start. That's a good point, but we target it. Uh, we, we look at, we don't look at relationships in general. The idea is to reduce the symptoms of depression or PTSD or eating disorders. So what we do is we see when the symptoms began and what was going on in the person's life. And we look at the relationships at that time. We realize, of course, you know, those relationships may have been a problem since childhood, but the idea is to deal with them now in the here and now. Okay, so that is another important aspect of IPT is that when we say relationship problem, we don't necessarily address 
I mean, we do be mindful of the past relationship problems, but the more important part is the here and now aspect of it. And, and you say there, and, and you mentioned there are like four major areas that we can pay attention to, right? The grief, right? The, conf, uh, the, the isolation part aspect of it, the conflict and the role change. And role transitions. Right. I can take you through very simply the procedures of IPT. Sure, it's sure. It's all in a manual, if you'd sure. like. <laughs> but maybe the audience would like to know what they are. Oh, of course, please. Well, you begin with um, a diagnosis. You know, what, do the, what is a patient coming for? And you do a clinical history, as you would for any medical condition. And you, and you get an idea of the symptoms. And then you give the patient what we call the sick role, which is we say, you have these symptoms and you're in treatment now to get help for them. We, you are not a depressed person. You are a person with depression, ah. which is very different. It's a very yes. important nuance. You are yes. a person with depression. You have this, this, these problems, and that's what we're going to work on. Uh -huh. You're not a depressed person that you're going to have to be like this for the rest of your life. Now, people who are dysthymic have, uh, you know, that's a little bit different, and, and those, those patients are harder to treat and usually require medication in addition to uh, right. psychotherapy. So after we do that, um, we then get do what's called the interpersonal inventory. Uh -huh. And we, do, we don't go back to the childhood. Obviously, if the person wants to talk about their childhood, we don't say we're not going to listen to that. Right, right. <laughs> we, we find out who are the important people in the person's life, mm -hmm. who supports them, and who is giving them trouble. Uh -huh. And that usually brings us right to the problem area. And, and then we explain. Now, you know, sometimes the person comes in and says, my biggest problem is my, my husband, and that's what I want to work on. So you don't have to go through all of that. <laughs> but you might also find out who is supportive in the family or friends. And then you, you explain what the therapy is, that you're going to try to understand the, uh, the issues that brought on the depression and work on those, that you're going to work for a certain period of time. And that varies greatly, but it's usually good to say we're going to work for three weeks, six weeks, one year, some time with the idea that at the end of that period, we're going to see how you're doing and what more needs to be done, or whether we can terminate. It's not a treatment forever. That doesn't mean the patient may not go into treatment forever, but not with the same treatment. Right. Unless they're in maintenance treatment, which I'll, I'll mention. Well, then we identify with the patient the problem area. And when we're flexible about this. They can be two problem areas. They can be, um, they can change during the course of treatment, but it's a focus on what we're going to work on. Grief, disputes, transitions, or loneliness. And, and there's a manual for how we deal with each one of those. And then at the end of the time, when we do termination, we review how the patient is done, review of the symptoms and the social functioning. Usually the symptoms can go improve early and the social functioning takes longer. Uh -huh. And then we come up with a plan for the future, which could be maintenance treatment, which is see me once a month. It could be another treatment or it could be goodbye and call me if you need me. Um, depending on what the patient wants and how symptomatic and functioning they are right we don't cure people of themselves but we help them have a reduction of symptoms and improvement of functioning that's IPT okay in a nutshell it, it has been modified for PTSD John John Markovitz has just written a book about that uh, there's it has and that's been shown to be effective um, and doesn't require that you have uh, you, the person has to live through the event uh -huh. that caused the trauma. There's um, IPT for uh, eating disorders, uh, anxiety disorders, and distress. Uh, and there's a modification of IPT 
for uh, community health workers where you're dealing with distress without necessarily a formal psychiatric disorder. Which everyone stressed out all the time. So IPT, technically speaking, can be applied to anyone. <laughs> well, it doesn't work that well with substance abuse. Okay. <laughs> so they are the harder population to work with. Well, substance abuse is, is not usually produced by an interpersonal problem. It may cause interpersonal problems, but it's, I mean, we've had a few trials and it just didn't work that well. But I think one thing that's important about IPT, based on what you just described, is the fact that it's, your IPT can help people to reduce whatever symptom that they suffer from. PTSD, depression, anxiety, and it's measurable symptoms, it's not just like I feel better. Uh, so it's very concrete and measurable type of progress from... Yes, we recommend actually that uh, there be a clinical assessment and it doesn't matter how you do it. You can give a patient a PHQ-9 self-report or you can just ask questions. And we recommend that uh, during the course of the treatment, the depressive symptoms are assessed because the patients often will start to get better, but they don't quite realize it. <laughs> and if, if you do a, a symptom review, you, you know, you can show, hey, now you're sleeping better or your appetite's back. You have some concrete information. So something that's obvious to both the clinician and the clients in that sense. Yeah. Right. Now, I think one thing I, I thought is pretty important is starting from early on where you said when people suffer from depression, they need to understand they are not a depressed person, but they're a person who suffer from depression. That's sort of like uh, set, the, set the ball rolling as a very important aspect of uh, IPT, because once people realize not, they don't have fundamental problems, but is that they are just, that they are suffering from this illness, it somehow shifts their attitude towards it. Yeah, we hope so. We hope that's the whole purpose. I, and people do have fundamental problems, many of them, but we're not there to change them. We're there to help relieve the depression. Right. So I remember when I learned about IPT, one analogy was used a lot was like a diabetes. How some, when someone su suffer from diabetes, there yeah. are things they can manage to bring down the, the blood sugar level. You may need to use insulin as well, but then you also have to change your lifestyle. So, so when I learned about IPT, that was an analogy I was, they were given, how depression and diabetes have some similarities. Yeah, that's a good analogy. It sort of gives the clients a sense of... Uh, What's the word? Uh, empowering them that they could do something about their illness. Yes, that's exactly. That's a good good way of putting it. They're empowered. They have an illness. We know what that illness is, and we'll often give a a little educational seminar about depression to the patient. Uh -huh. You know that this the problem you're having in sleeping and eating and feeling life is not worth living. That's all part of the depression. Now, some patients are very sophisticated and they know all that. Uh -huh. They've had many recurrent episodes, but others aren't. And they don't realize that they're feeling that they're no longer attractive or that they're no longer smart. It's mm -hmm. all part of depression. Right. And, and that's part of the initial phase of educating about depression where education is needed. Uh -huh. And it's surprising. <laughs> Even smart, very smart people need an education about it because they don't, they don't put it together for themselves. Yeah, so it's like psycho, psychoeducation is sort of like an important aspect for people yeah. who start with IPT, but not, I don't think it's just for people with IPT, but I think in general, it's like a good knowledge to have on yes. how to have a better mental health. Yeah, and you can say, you know, that depression is very common and that it's very impairing. It can really ruin your life, but people do get better. There's many treatments. If this treatment doesn't work, there's other treatments we can try. Mm -hmm. um, we offer medication for patients who want to take it. And also the medications can be very helpful for some of the symptoms like the sleep problems uh -huh. and the appetite problems. So that's an alternative to have. 
There's no contraindication of having medication with IPT. Mm -hmm. In fact, for the severe depression, they do much better with the combination of treatments. So we educate them about that. Uh -huh. They may feel like life is lost and not, it's not worth living, but that's part of the illness. And that, that should get better. Now, right now, I mean, the reason why we're Zooming each other is because partly because the COVID-19, the pandemic era. How do you think IPT can contribute to the stress that people have from COVID-19? Oh, COVID-19 presents the, uh, the elements of the problem area. Uh -huh. First of all, people have died. So there's grief. And I think all of us know somebody who's died from COVID. Secondly, can you imagine the disputes? You suddenly have people who go to work every day, living together, the children are there, everybody is together. And, and people are feeling tired and, and upset and um, it can be very harmful to relationships. Now transitions, the third problem area. Well, COVID is a big change in your life. You don't go to work every day. Um, you don't have friends, you don't travel. Uh, you may lose your job or your job may have been diminished. Right. You may lose your paycheck. So it's full of transitions. And then loneliness. Um, for those people who live alone, um, the usual social networks outside the home can be um, totally lost and people are very, can be very isolated. It's very easy to put IPT within the framework of, uh, of the pandemic. Yeah, those four areas you just mentioned are probably something we all experienced during the pandemic time. The road yeah. transition, I mean, people lose their jobs, people uh, eat, lose uh, their position and isolation. I think we can all identify with that aspect of COVID-19. Losing someone we love and uh, conflict with the co-workers or family members. In fact, I think like there's a lot of more domestic violence during COVID-19 right. time right now yeah. because of it. In the, in the studies we've been doing, we we have a group of people we've been following for many years. So we have an understanding of the core of their clinical state over years. And we happen to have interviewed them, <clears throat> excuse me, about within a year of COVID. So we followed them up. And what we found is the new cases were all in people who previously had been symptom free. Where, so we have the people who have symptoms and then the addition of those who develop symptoms for the first time. And that probably accounts for the high rates. Yeah, so it is a quite difficult time for all of us to go through this pandemic. But we asked them what helped them. <laughs> okay. And this will, this will surprise you. The thing that helped the most was cooking and baking. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't published that one yet. <laughs> well, talking to friends and family, of course, and Zooming. But it was the cooking and baking that was most associated with the reduction of symptoms. <laughs> But, but I, I mean, you know, cooking and baking is not as simple as people think, you know. Sometimes cooking and baking means you have to cook for someone that you, you care about, you love about. And it could be a teamwork, right? Bring people together. Yes. And you have a product at the end. Yeah. It's a very concrete way of, you know, dealing with distress. Also, the thing that's changed is that so many of us are used to eating out every day. If you go to work, you have lunch out. Uh -huh. um, and of course, if you socialize, you often socialize over food. Right. And now um, the use of restaurants has been markedly reduced, especially in the winter time when it's hard to eat outdoors. I think one thing I learned from IPT in the past is also that uh, IPT encourage us to look for new options on how to improve those four areas. Grief, yeah. right? Road transitions. So would you 
Would you mind to share us a story, let's say a, a more concrete example on how, let's say, IPT helps someone to deal with losing of a loved one? I have not been uh, involved in the treatment of patients with IPT. We've done um, I supervise residents. I'm trying to think of some of their cases. Uh -huh. And I, uh, but uh, with people I've studied were not in treatment. They're just a, a cohort we have followed who are high risk for depression. And it just so happened we had interviewed them within a year. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't offer them treatment. They don't live here. They live all over the country. Uh -huh. um, I, I'd have to think about that. No, no problem. But I think that uh, grief is a, such a common sort of a, a issue that we all human will need to sort of face and deal with. So I think one thing I learned from IPT is that it sort of helped us to sort of have a healthy attitude towards it, right? Like a, how to turn towards the actual fact, this sort of... Uh, existential fact that sooner or later we will lose someone and there are still ways we can live beyond yes. this fact. Yes, and of course I remember one case of a, of a woman who was married for 40 years to the same man and uh, they had no children but they had a very tight bond and, and he died of COVID. And she was totally at loss. And I think what, I mean, all you do in the beginning is you live, you help the person live with the grief and to mourn the person in IPT, you, you know, to go over the daily life together and what was lost. And gradually there's uh, a beginning to think about how to have substitutes. And I remember there was one woman, we suggested that she get involved with a group. Uh -huh. But, you know, again, we couldn't suggest she go out to an in-person group, but she did eventually join a Zoom group of widows. And that, that was helpful to her. But that was, it was not, it was only, it was made more difficult by the pandemic because uh, she was a woman without a psychiatric history and she would have been able to uh, enter into new social activities, but they mm -hmm. just weren't available. Uh -huh. So the, the options were closed to her. Sure, sure. Well, I think the idea is that when we are able to sort of face towards the problem, we're more likely to see the options for it as well. D Dr. Wiseman, any final words or comment that you would like well, our audience to have? Yeah, I just, I'll just close with a couple of things. One is that IPT has become very popular in low and middle income countries. Huh. Uh, we have a big project in Mozambique. We did a big study, two studies in Uganda. Okay. Um, it's being used in Lebanon for refugees, and there you can see the trans. The idea of transition is a big one. Okay, right, uh, right. There's uh, there's studies in Poland. There's studies in Liberia. Um, I don't mean research studies. I mean just applications. Sure, sure. So, uh, what is very heartwarming is that there might be slight nuances of differences between these different cultures uh -huh. but the uh the idea of importance of human attachments and the severance of attachments uh -huh. leading to depression seems to be universal and our biggest users is china now <laughs> and when we um they've translated all our books into into mandarin or whatever language whatever dialect is you're being used. They are offering training programs. Uh, they've incorporated it into their clinics. And they, for some reason, it's a very, very popular. Good. Well, like what you say, re relationship, relationship, relationship is universal. <laughs> it is universal. And 
that's a a heartwarming thing to think it brings us closer. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Wiseman. This is a wonderful conversation okay. with you. Welcome and nice meeting you. And I hope people are interested and learn something from this, then I will feel good about it. Great, great. And they have to remember, IPT is a fantastically good treatment, but it's not the only one and it doesn't work for everybody. Sure. And it course. doesn't work for the same people all the time. It's just like any other treatment. Right. One great option to have. Well, goodbye. And uh, <laughs> I hope we are in touch some other time. So thank you for watching Cafe 229. I hope you learned something from Dr. Wiseman's uh, IPT. And hopefully we know that IPT is a one great option to have to deal with depression. Stay tuned for the next episode.